Edward Glazer is the Fred and Eleanor Glimp Professor of Economics at Harvard University. He is also the director of two think tanks, the Taubman Center for State and Local Government at Harvard and the Rappaport Institute for Greater Boston Area. He's also a regular columnist for the Boston Globe. In early 2011, if you were reading the New York Times, or The Economist, or listening to NPR, National Public Radio, or reading The New Yorker, or reading practically any other major publication in the United States or the Western world, you may have seen a lengthy and enthusiastic review of a book entitled Triumph of the City, How Our Greatest Invention Makes Us Richer, Smarter, Greener, Healthier, and Happier. That book has propelled Professor Glazer into countless arenas of urban policy discussion and has created no shortage of debate about urban policy and prospects. And it's now a staple reference in urban economics programs and planning and other fields related to study of the city. Partly this is because the book is so engaging and so readable. But popular books don't always stand the test of time. And we might wonder if the sometimes provocative views that Professor Glazer uh, has uh, put forward are being accepted by his peers. And I have an answer to that. The American Economic Association, 18,000 strong, is the world's backbone organization for, for academic and research economists. And I have no doubt that every Nobel laureate in economics is an active member of that organization. Each year, at its annual meeting, the American Economic Association has a keynote address known as the Richard T. Eli Lecture. I think it was the 53rd this year. And the list of Eli lecturers includes a dozen or so Nobel laureates and chairs of the President's Council of Economic Advisors and is basically a who's who in the world of research economics. Well, last month, that lecture was given by Professor Glazer. And there's little I can add about how well his work is regarded among the leading economists of our time. So we're going to hear from him, I project, for a long time to come. So let's get started. Welcome, Professor Glazer. Thank you. Thank, thank you. I'm, I'm thrilled to be here. And, uh, and who knows, I gave my Eli lecture on, on the history of real estate speculation in the United States. So maybe I'll come back at some later verse from uh, Ben and talk to you about that. But today I'm talking about my book, Triumph of the City. And, and I want to start with a portrait of America. And, and I call it a portrait to remind you that, among other things, economists are fa famous for having absolutely no aesthetic sense whatsoever. Um, but this is something, at least, of a portrait. What I've done is I've taken the 3,000 odd counties in the United States, and I've broken them into tents, 300 counties in each, in each one of those dots. And I've divided them on the basis of density, because at their heart, cities are the absence of physical space between people and firms. Cities are density, proximity, closeness. What the bottom line shows is the relationship between density and per capita household, median household income. And you can see the steady rise with density levels. The densest tenth of America's counties have incomes that are on average 50% higher than the least dense half of America's counties. The three largest metropolitan areas in this country, New York, Los Angeles, and Chicago, produce 18% of America's GDP, while including only 13% of America's population. And if the country as a whole saw its productivity levels rise to those in the New York metropolitan area, our national GDP would go up by 43%. Now, the productivity of cities is well known. It's been extensively studied. And there's, of course, a huge debate as to how much of this is actually caused by density versus other factors that are going on. But I think I can fairly say that the literature has established that at least some sizable component of this is really reflecting the fact that when you're surrounded by more people, you actually do become more productive. Now, the somewhat more surprising fact is illustrated by the top line, which is the relationship between initial density levels and population growth between 2000 and 2010. So keep in mind these facts came out after I wrote my book, since the census wasn't out when I was writing it. 
What this shows is that until you get to the densest tenth of America's counties, population growth rises steadily with, with initial population density levels. The less land you had initially, the faster was the growth. So whereas at the start of the 19th century, Americans left their dense enclaves on the eastern seaboard to populate the empty spaces of the interior, at the start of the 21st century, instead of spreading out, we're clustering in. Now, the image on the cover of my book is an elongated, a stretched out version of Chicago. But of course, when you think about the triumph of the city, you want to think also about Orlando. You want to think about Miami. You want to think about Atlanta. You want to think even about Las Vegas. Right? Cities don't just mean old style skyscrapers, although there's plenty to be said in those areas as well. Now, we've just been through a horrendous real estate experience, a horrendous housing experience. I think it's, it's colored the entire economy of the United States. And this is one way of looking at that experience. What this graph shows is the relationship between housing price growth, according to the Federal Housing Finance Agency's repeat sales index, between 2001 and 2006, and that's along the horizontal axis. Along the vertical axis is decline between 2006 and 2011. So the vertical axis growth between 2001 and 2006 the, the, the vertical axis declined between 2006 and 2011. Now, it is normal for housing prices to mean revert. If they go up over five years by an extra dollar, they go down over the next five years by 32 cents. Right? That's a very standard thing. But this isn't 32 percent mean reversion. This is 95 percent mean reversion. This was a giant tsunami that came in and left. Now, there are patterns to this boom bus cycle. Above all, it's about January temperature, because the boom was, in fact, very much of a warm area phenomenon. This is the relationship between price growth between 2001 and 2006 and average January temperature in the metropolitan area. And I've sorted them in terms of bins. I'm not exactly sure what this means. Perhaps a rational exuberance supports cold weather. I don't know. Um, but of course, it was also true that the bust was centered in, in warm areas as well. And that's what you're seeing here. This is price declines between 2006 and 2011 and January temperature. I'm going to be coming back to warmth later in the, later in the talk. And I think we, when we come back to that, or maybe in the questions, we can go back to this particular fact. But while January temperature doesn't show any relationship with price growth over the longer period, density does. This somewhat messier graph shows the relationship between density as of the year 1990 and price growth over the entire 1996 to 2012 period. And what you can see is, with some prominent exceptions, Notice Detroit, which is one of those few metropolitan areas that managed to miss the boom and still experience the bust. But uh, what you see is, is a steady positive relationship where the more dense metropolitan areas experience faster growth over this time period. Um, and of course, that's true within metropolitan areas as well. This is the relationship between price growth and proximity to the center of the metropolitan area over the 2001 to 2008 time period, which is all the zip code level data that I have, I have available. Now, the good things that are happening in the denser parts of America, high wages, high prices, population growth, are remarkable. They're remarkably different from the world of the 1970s, but they're nothing relative to what's happening in the greater world in terms of the triumph of the city. We've just passed that amazing halfway point in 2007, where more than 50% of humanity now lives in cities. And it's hard not to think that on net, that's a very good thing, because when you compare those countries that are more than 50% urbanized to those countries that are less than 50% urbanized, the more urbanized countries have on average incomes that are five times as high and infant mortality levels that are less than a third. Gandhi famously said the growth of the nation, meaning India, depends not on cities but on its villages. With all due respect, on this one the great man was completely and utterly wrong. Because, in fact, the growth of India does not depend on its villages, it depends on its cities. It depends on Bangalore and Mumbai and Gargan and the places that are connecting the developing world with the developed world, connecting co across continents and civilizations, providing pathways out of poverty into prosperity and transforming the world. Um, the, this shows the relationship between income and density for the US, India, and China. And the US is, is depicted here. And then you see the blue one, which is India, and the orange one, which is China. And as you can see, the density earnings relationship is actually much higher outside the United States, as strong as it is in the US. In these developing world uh, cities, economic prosperity is even more tightly tied to urbanization. Now, the critics 
of urbanization in the developing world suggests that some sort of terrible bucolic past is being lost in the, in the transformation to urban life. That somehow or other we're going from a Wordsworthian world in which everyone was frolicking in the beautiful green grass and enjoying the, the un, unsullied rivers and lakes of, of rural Indian China. Anyone who thinks that has never actually been to rural Indian China where in fact people are living in the same stultifying poverty, the same painful disease, the same enormous deprivation in which humanity has lived for most of its existence. And one summary measure that we have of this is self-reported life satisfaction. Now in the US, there's no relationship between how happy people say they are and whether or not they live in a big city or not. After all, what self-respecting New Yorker is gonna tell some interviewer that he's happy, right? Um, but that is, that is true in the developing world. And this shows across countries in the world the share of the population saying that they're satisfied with their life by urbanization. As you, and as you can see, in the least urbanized countries, about 50% say that they're, they're satisfied. In the most, the number rises to about 75%. And within developing world countries as well, you also see a steady tendency of people who live in cities to say that they're more happy with their lives. Now, this is in some sense a paradox. And it's the paradox that I want you to focus on for the next bit of the talk, which is we live in an era in which distance is dead, in which we can all effortlessly telecommute to whatever uh, whatever workspace we have, in which we could all occupy whatever sylvan, woodsy spot that appeals to our biophilia, our love of nature. We could just dial it in in so many ways, in so many places, and yet over and over again we choose the inconveniences of cities. We put up with high prices, we put up with congestion. Why is it the, the cyber prophets, the, uh, the seers of the electronic age were predicting 20 years ago that all this electronic technology would make face-to-face -face contact in the cities that enable it obsolete. Why hasn't that happened? Why hasn't the internet, the fax machine, why hasn't it made the traditional benefits of being next to each other uh, irrelevant? Now, this relatively rosy view of cities is very different from the New York City of my youth. I was born in Manhattan in 1967, and these are two iconic images from my childhood. Uh, New York had been experiencing in the 1960s massive economic dislocation. The largest industrial cluster in the United States in the 1950s was not automobile production in Detroit. It was garment production in New York City. And the garment industry was hammered by globalization. Right? You don't see too many clothes that are sewn in New York any, anymore. They're sewn in China, they're sewn in Vietnam, they're sewn somewhere very, very far away. Hundreds of thousands of jobs disappeared over a few short years. A company accompanying the decline in, in industry was increasing social problems, a, a vast rise in crime rates between 1960 and 1975. And on top of that, the government was unable to pay its bills. Declining revenues, increasing costs, meant that New York City was broke. And New York found itself hand in hand going to the federal government and getting turned down by President Ford for its request for a bailout, which by the way, as, as much as I, I love my native city, I actually felt was a fairly good idea on the part of, of Gerald Ford, given that New York really did have to get its fiscal house in order first. Um, but it really felt during those years that not just President Ford, but history itself was telling New York and every one of America's older, colder histories to, cities to drop dead. That New York and Buffalo and Detroit and Boston and Seattle all seemed as if they were headed for the trash heap of history. Uh, the top image shows Jimmy Carter wandering through the wasteland that the South Bronx had become. When it seemed as if really these urban spaces were about to be retaken by the weeds, that we were going to go back to some world in which trees were going to grow when there, where there had once been thriving neighborhoods, and where we're going to be like something out of the last scene of Planet of the Apes, where the Statue of Liberty comes peeking out of the sand uh, in a place that had once been New York. One of the reasons why cities seemed so obsolete in the 1970s was that they had lost their fundamental reason for being. Cities came about as nodes of a transportation network that enabled Americans to access the great wealth of the American interior. If you go back to 1816, it cost as much to move goods 30 miles over land as it did to ship them across the entire Atlantic Ocean. It was just that difficult to get anything around in this country. Over the course of the 19th century, we built an amazing transportation network. First canals, Erie Canal, and Illinois and Michigan Canal, and then railroads that supplemented the canals. And cities grew up pinch points of that watery network, like Buffalo, the western terminus of the Erie Canal, like Chicago, the city that is a linchpin of the watery arc that goes all the way from New York to New Orleans. And then industry grew up around these areas. New York's three great industries in the 19th century were garment production, printing and publishing, and, and sugar refining, 
All three of them were there because of the port. New York did a huge amount of business with the Caribbean, and of course, sugar was going to come north. You couldn't refine sugar in the hot climate of the Caribbean in the 19th century and expect it to stay refined during the long, hot sea voyage, so you had to refine it closer to the, to the point of consumption. That's why great family fortunes like the Havemeyers and the Roosevelts, the money that eventually put FDR in the White House, came from Isaac Roosevelt, who was not, as Madman suggested, a farmer, but in fact, he was a sh sugar refiner. Uh, a classic uh, urban, urban occupation. Printing and publishing was there because the big money in 19th century printing and publishing was in pirated English novels, right? No developing world thief of American property rights, American intellectual property had anything on our boys in the 1820s. Now, the thing is, if you're going to print pirated novels, you better print first, right? There's no money in publishing the eighth pirated edition of Girl with the Dragon Tattoo. And so it really paid to be in the port where the books came first. So the Harper Brothers, New York's great publishers, were able to get the latest Sir Walter Scott novel, Pedal of the Peak, days before it even showed up in the hands of their Philadelphia competitors, Perry and Lee, and flood the market with it. The port caused the industry to grow, including finance, which is, of course, today the mainstay of, of Manhattan. Now, Chicago, right, Chicago wasn't about sugar refining, it did have plenty of garment production, but its great industry was the stockyards. The stockyards were there, again, for very understandable reasons. America is fantastic at growing corn. It's one of the things we do incredibly well, and we would do it well even without utterly benighted agricultural subsidies. I'm sorry, that was a completely unnecessary editorial aside. Um, the, um, the, we still would be incredibly good at it. The problem with corn is it is now and always has been a relatively low value per ton product. And as a result, shipping the stuff was the critical problem. In the early days, we solved it by transforming it to that very durable, very portable, and quite tasty product, whiskey. Then we moved to salted pigs, and after all, pigs are corn with feet. And then finally, when this guy, Armour, figures out the technology of refrigerated rail cars, right, we move to shipping dressed beef. And that's, of course, what Chicago does. It has access to the corn fields of Illinois and Iowa. Cattle is brought to Chicago, it's slaughtered in the stockyards, and then it's shipped uh, via the rail yards, rail yards east. Now, while Chicago came about almost as if it was solving an operations research problem of minimizing transportation costs, Amazing things happen when smart people are congregated in urban areas. It has always been so. It was such when Aristotle, when Plato and, and Socrates bickered on an Athenian street corner. It was that where in Renaissance Florence, where a chain of genius created what we think of as, as modern three-dimensional painting. And it was there in Chicago in the 1880s when architects came together and created the great form that would reshape cities. What you're looking at is William of Arangeni's home insurance building. It is called by many the, the Ur skyscraper, the first skyscraper, meaning a tall building with a load-bearing steel or cast iron skeleton. And its architect, William Byron Jenny, is often called the father of the skyscraper. Now, of course, the architectural historians have a lively debate on this topic because, in fact, this is not a proper skyscraper. Only the front two walls have a load-bearing steel skeleton. The back two walls have traditional thick masonry walls. And indeed, there were plenty of other people who had the idea for a steel skeleton building in the 1820s. And indeed, there had been industrial buildings that had been built with steel skeletons before this. So is Jenny the father of the architect? Is it perhaps Daniel Burnham? Is it Lewis Sullivan who gave the skyscraper its, its most notable form? Um, is it Ab or is it Root? There are no end of people who are possible candidates for this. But to see, search for a single father of the architect is to miss the point of how innovation works. The skyscraper, like every other idea, that humanity has ever had that's worth anything was a collaborative effort. It was collectively created by people who all knew each other, who all stole each other's ideas. After all, you know, Sullivan and, and Burnham were both apprentices in Jenny's office. They all knew each other incredibly well. And they were all working frantically to do this thing, copying each other's ideas. This is what cities do that is most important. They enable us to learn from one another. They enable the spread of knowledge that has been responsible for humanity's greatest hits for millennia. Now, just as there was a cluster of architectural genius in Chicago in the 1880s, there was a cluster in, of automotive genius in Detroit 10 years later. Detroit, of course, fits the model of a classic inland port. After all, every one of the 20 largest American cities in 1900 was on a major waterway from the oldest, New York and Boston, where the river meets the sea, to the newest, Minneapolis, on the northernmost navigable point on the Mississippi River. Detroit, Detroit, was on the straits. And of course, it was a center for industries like Detroit Dry Dock a cutting-edge company that specialized in building boats that plied the Great Lakes trade. Detroit Dry Dock then provided jobs for people like this character, the young farm boy Henry Ford, who came to Detroit and got his start working on engines at Detroit Dry Dock. 
But then Ford moved on. He went to work for Edison, and then he decided to join the great American game of trying to make cheap automobiles. Now, contrary to what you may have heard from President Obama, Americans did not, invent, in fact, invent the car. Uh, most properly, that, that credit is given to um, Germans. But in fact, we did make it cheap. And it didn't happen by Ford alone. There was a cluster of genius in Detroit in the 1890s, the Dodge brothers, the Fisher brothers, David Dunbar, Buick, Ransom E. Olds, Billy Durant in nearby Flint, all of whom knew each other, borrowed each other's ideas, supplied each other with parts and financing, and collaboratively made this work. According to, to legend, Ford followed Charles Kirby, who in fact didn't build the first car in Detroit. Ford followed Kirby on a bicycle as Kirby drove down the streets of the city, trying frantically to figure out how Kirby's car worked. I can think of no better image of cities as being places where we learn from each other than the young Henry Ford figuring out how cars work by trying to see what Kirby did. And collaboratively, collectively, they did it. They managed to turn Detroit into probably the most productive place on the planet in 1950. Um, the problem is this was Ford's big idea. This is the, the River Rouge, right? A massive vertically integrated plant walled off from the outside world employing tens of thousands of Look, of less educated, less skilled workers. Now, in the short run, this model was a marvelous model for productivity, right? Unbelievably productive, bringing cheap cars to ordinary Americans, bringing high wages to the workers who happened to labor in the Rouge. In the long run, this is a terrible model for urban resilience. Successful cities at the start of the 19th century were marked by three things, small firms, smart people, and connections to the outside world. The same three things mark successful cities today. It's not that there's anything wrong with a large factory, but a large factory doesn't need, to this, need the city and it doesn't give to the city. It is, it is a thing apart, right? and that's exactly what the Rouge became. And when conditions change, and they always change, you will move that factory to whatever area reduces your cost. And that's exactly what happened over the 20th century. At the start, it made sense to have automobile production in, in Detroit. As transportation costs declined, and this is the decline in the cost of moving a ton of mile by rail over the 20th century, declined by over 90%. It, at the end of the 20th century, or even after World War II, there was no longer an advantage to be near the Great Lakes. There was no longer an advantage to be near the old rail system. You just moved the factories to cheaper locations. The work of Tom Holmes of the University of Minnesota shows the incredible power of state-level policies for driving this. He shows that when you compare counties on pro-business, i.e. right-to-work uh, states, with those counties on the other st line, other side of the state, in an anti-business state, the manufacturing growth in the pro-business states was wildly higher than in the anti-business states between 1947 and, 19, and 1992. And of course, the move to January temperature was partially about, the, the move to sun was partially about the, the pro-business policies followed in the South. But of course, it wasn't just about that. Over the course of the 20th century, a richer country was increasingly willing to pay for the amenity of actually living in some place that was pleasant. For there's no variable that better predicts metropolitan area growth over the 20th century than January temperature. And it still continues to predict metropolitan area growth. Now, one of the reasons why it was surprising that there was such a strong price effect of January temperature during the boom is that a th there's a third major reason why there's been so much population growth in warmer areas. These areas make it easy to build. And in fact, pro-business, pro-development policies in the warmer areas of, of this country have been responsible for a fairly large share of population growth in these warmer areas over the last 30 years. If you want to ask why Atlanta, Dallas, Houston, and Phoenix have each added about a million people to their metropolitan areas since 2000, the fact that they make it easy to build plays a large role in that. There are, in fact, more people per square mile in Harris County, Texas, than there are in Middlesex County, Massachusetts, where I live. Right? So there's considerably more land per capita in the county that I live. And of course, housing prices are vastly higher. And yet, there's very, very little population growth in Middlesex County, because to a first order approximation, the nimbiest uh, communities in my, in my neck of the woods allow, let's say, zero new building. Let's use that as a, as a, as a first order approximation for it. Not so obviously in Atlanta, Dallas, Houston, and Phoenix. Along with the move to, to sun was the move to sprawl. We have always built, we have always built our living spaces around the transportation technology that was dominant in the era in which they were being constructed. Right? The oldest cities, even the oldest urban areas in, in this country, are built at pedestrian scale. They're built for foot traffic, narrow blocks, short streets, winding pathways. Right? This is how people walk. And then increasingly you move towards grids, wider spaces, wider streets associated with the early wheel transportation, the omnibuses that came to New York in the 1820s, drawn by horses up and down Broadway. 
Then you move to cities that are city, urban spaces that are built around the streetcar, built around the um, early elevated railroads. All of these were sprawl of their time. Right? And in some sense, when you think about Jane Jacobs famously arguing against putting a highway uh, through her, her Greenwich Village area, she was arguing for the sprawl of the early 19th century, for in fact Greenwich Village was an earlier example of sprawl, against the sprawl of the 20th century. We have always built our clean spaces around the dominant transportation technology, so it's not surprising that we now in the 20th century, in the second half of the 20th century, we rebuilt our spaces around the car. The average commute by car in this country is by car in this country is 24 minutes. The average commute by public transportation is 48 minutes. It is not a surprise that Americans loved automobiles. But of course, automobiles are fundamentally different from all the other transportation technologies because unlike taking an elevated railroad, unlike taking a streetcar, they're point to point. They don't involve walking when, as your final destination, except maybe from the parking lot. Whereas all of these older transportation technologies in, required the density that would enable you to walk from wherever the thing dropped you off to your final, uh, to your final destination. So this was an entire re-envisioning of urban space. And so we had areas like Levittown, built in the post-war period, uh, uh, in some sense a hybrid, uh, but showing the power of mass-produced construction to make good homes affordable for ordinary Americans, and then, of course, we have the Woodlands, a far more luxurious example of car-based living on the, edges of the, on the edge of Houston. Um, nothing surprising about that. In terms of public policy, I do not join, uh, as much as I am an urbanist, I do not join with those, with those urbanists who have any problem with the car. I take a car to work every, every day, and I also live in a, in a car-oriented suburb. I do think we want to think about those federal policies that artificially subsidize driving. Too often, when you hear politicians talk about the need for infrastructure, need for government spending on infrastructure. They're talking about funding highways with taxpayer dollars. Right? And indeed, we've been doing this for the last 60 years. The work of Nathaniel Baum Snow at Brown shows that each new highway that cut into a metropolitan area reduced the central city's population by about 18% relative to the metropolitan area as a whole. Right? Nothing wrong with highways, but the, there's been a basic principle of economics for the past 200 years, which is that infrastructure should be paid for by users. And there's no reason why drivers shouldn't pay for their own highways rather than having it subsidized by ordinary taxpayers. The same thing is true for public transportation. Hit by the move to sun and sprawl, all of America's older, colder cities experienced some trauma. These were the 10 largest cities in the United States in 1950. Eight out of the 10 lost 20% or more of their population. Three of them lost more than 50% of their population. Cleveland, Detroit, and St. Louis. LA is the only city in this group that experienced large population growth. And of course, LA is quite different than any of these older cities. And New York, somewhat amazingly, is the other one that managed to keep its population stable. Along with the move to sudden sprawl, along with the deindustrialization of these cities, was a social collapse. No one exactly knows why crime rates soared so much between 1960 and 1975. But when riots broke out in Detroit in 1967, it really felt as if civilization itself, a creation of the cities, had fled those urban areas. It really felt uh, as if uh, urban space was no longer feasible as a, as a civilized place. Uh, uh, and indeed, Detroit seemed fairly hopeless for a long period of time. Now, the federal government wasn't exactly helpful. Um, in the 50s and 60s, they invested in urban renewal. After the Federal Highway Aid Act of 1973, they invested in transportation, public transit systems. Now, the hallmark of declining cities is that they have an abundance of structures and infrastructure relative to the level of demand. Right? Um, more than 90% of the homes in central city Detroit are valued below construction costs. It would never make sense in a free market if they fell down to build them up again. And yet what urban renewal did was it subsidized new building in a place that didn't need new building. Right? These, this is a city that was built for 1.85 million people. It has less than half of that number now. Right? Now it's so, something of a Potemkin village strategy that our elected leaders have followed thinking that actually by putting up a shiny tower in some downtown area, you can declare that that city is back. But it's not back, because cities at their heart are not structures. They're people. And structures are incredibly important, but they're only important if they serve the people who actually live in the city. The same thing goes with transportation infrastructure. Here we see Detroit's people mover monorail, something like something out of a Simpsons episode, right? I mean, here this thing is going around. You notice immediately something remarkable about the streets below the monorail. They're empty. It's easy to get around downtown Detroit. You didn't need a monorail. You can drive perfectly quickly. Right? And yet, because the federal government was there subsidizing the stuff, this is what you got. You got monorails in declining cities that didn't need them instead of actually investing in people, instead of providing the education that the kids in Detroit badly needed, instead of investing in police resources that would have made sure that every child 
didn't have to look over his shoulder when he was walking down, down the street. This is what you got. Now, Detroit is still troubled. And they're still troubled by thinking that, that magical transportation bus will still save them. I was in a, in a charter school about a year ago. Extraordinary place in the building where Harley Earl used to design those wonderful cars for General Motors 50 years ago. Now it's a charter school teaching uh, kids, disadvantaged kids. Hope is on all of their faces. And yet you talk to the head of the charter school, what's he pinned his hopes on? The light rail stop that might come outside of there. How in the world do you need a light rail on the empty streets that run down there where you can run a, run a bus at a perfectly speedy route is, is beyond me. Now, Detroit has not yet turned its, its way around by any stretch of the imagination. Indeed, there are some older, colder cities that remain considerably troubled. But many cities have come back. And I think it's hard now to even remember that there was a time where Seattle didn't look very different from Detroit. In 1971, two real estate jokers put up a sign on a highway outside the city asking the last person to leave to please turn out the lights. Because Boeing, mighty Boeing, was cutting back on its jobs. Just as no one could imagine a Detroit with a smaller General Motors, no one could imagine a Seattle with a smaller Boeing. This is before Microsoft, before Amazon, before Costco, and Starbucks is at best the faint whiff of an aroma in a coffee roaster's nostrils. Right? Seattle came back not because of monorails, not really because of anything that the government did. It came back because of entrepreneurship. It came back because of new ideas in an old city. And the city helped that make that happen. One thing that governments have done that has proved to be of lasting value to cities is investing in land-grant colleges. The work of Enrico Moretti at Berkeley shows that those cities that had land-grant colleges prior to 1940 have experienced significantly higher wages in the last 30 years. They've also experienced significantly faster population growth. Um, Boston's land-grant college, of course, is MIT, um, which has, has played an outsized role in economic innovation in Boston for the last 100 years. The two images there are, the one on your left is Manavar Bush, the entrepreneur and MIT scientist and counselor to presidents who gave us Raytheon, as well as being the mentor to the young Fred Terman, who had come east for his PhD at MIT and then would turn to be a dean and provost at Stanford and be the father of Stanford Industrial Park and really one of the great leaders of Silicon Valley's creation. Terman was very much borrowing Manavar Bush's model of the connection between university and the outside world. The other image is Arthur D. Little. Well, it's not Arthur D. Little himself. It's the Arthur D. Little building at MIT, but I couldn't find a non-copyrighted picture of Arthur D. Little himself. Uh, Arthur D. Little was, again, an MIT chemist. He starts the Ur Consulting Company in, in Boston, again, the, the centerpiece for a large and thriving industry that would come after it. New York's comeback, of course, is tied to finance. 43% of the payroll in the island of Manhattan in 2007 was in financial services and insurance. And it's not a surprise that finance is so centered in urban areas, because there's no industry in which being a little bit smarter, in which knowing a little bit more, can yield such vast returns. Overnight, being a little bit clever can make you a fortune in this industry. So it makes sense to put up with the inconvenience of being in a city in order to get access to every possible bit of information that you possibly could get. This is an image of the bullpen at City Hall. And now, since it wasn't mentioned in the introduction, I can say either by means of, of disclosure or advertising. I also write a column every other week for Bloomberg View. So uh, interpret that as they will. But I keep this up because Bloomberg is, is this, this office, this picture, symbolizes three things about, about cities and New York's comeback. The first of which is that Bloomberg is part of a chain of innovation in finance that starts with a more sophisticated approach to, to risk and return trade-offs. It starts in the University of Chicago with academics like Milton Friedman and Jimmy Savage. That then gets passed to younger academics like Harry Markowitz and Sharp, who then applied it and developed a rigorous financial theory, one that we all use today. Those ideas then got carried by people like Jack Trainer and Fisher Black to Wall Street. Those ideas then served the young Michael Milken, who was able to convince investors that his high yield debt, junk bonds if you will, carried enough return to offset the risks. Those junk bonds then enabled the young Henry Kravis to engage in larger and larger leveraged buyouts, getting value out of companies like RJR and Nabisco. Securitization was part of this trend, and so were Bloomberg's terminals, which are, of course, about providing the data that one needs for sophisticated financial analysis. Bloomberg is, the Bloomberg story is important for another reason, though, which is that it's about the urban ability to create cross-industry leaps. Many of the most important things that have come out of human invention involve taking an idea from one industry and bringing it to another one. Bloomberg, of course, is not a financial billionaire. He's an IT billionaire. And in some sense, he's competing, not with people in New York, but with people in Silicon Valley. 
but he's able to compete so successfully with them when he starts his own company 30 years ago, precisely because he had run the trading floor at Solomon Brothers, precisely because he had run their tech operation, and he knew in a way that no programmer living in Atherton could possibly know what the guys at Merrill Lynch wanted. He had the knowledge the city had given him, and that enabled him to be a, a leaper, to move from one industry to another. But there's a third reason that I have this, have this thing down, which is its spatial configuration. It's a wallless office. It's modeled on the bullpen at Bloomberg LLP, which is, of course, modeled on the Solomon Brothers trading floor. Now, when you think about it, there's something funny about trading floors. Here we have some of the most prosperous people on the planet who, in a normal industry, in a normal world, would live in large offices surrounded by open furniture, protected by secretaries, enjoying all the perquisites of privacy that their wealth has, has enabled them to purchase. But there they are in the trading floor sweating on top of each other. They're right next to each other. It's a mess. It's uncomfortable. Right? Why are they doing it? Why are they putting up with all this? Why aren't they living like uh, people in my industry do, with too much space around us? Right? It's precisely because knowledge is more important than space because they want to be right there in the middle of the action, because they need to know what's going on. That is why training floors exist, and that's also why cities came back. Because what globalization and new technologies did was they increased the returns to being smart. They increased the returns to innovation. And we are a social species that gets smart by being around other smart people. This is what trading floors do. This is what cities do. The higher the returns to innovation, the more important it is to be surrounded by people that you can learn from, by people that you can borrow ideas from. We have evolved over millions of years to have this remarkable ability to come out of the womb and soak up information from our parents, from our peers, from our siblings, even occasionally from our teacher. Right? And anyone who's ever taught knows the hard part about teaching is not knowing your script. It's knowing whether or not anything you're saying is getting through. And we have, in a small room, we have these wonderful ways of communicating comprehension or confusion that are lost when you're trying to do the thing by Skype that are lost when you're not next to each other behind the water cooler. The more complicated the world is, the easier it is for ideas to be lost in translation. That's why Silicon Valley, right? I mean, of all the industries in the world that should be able to do long distance work, they cluster right next to each other. They're all in one dense cluster of talent. Google, of all the companies in the world, what company should be able to do you know, long distance stuff? They should be able to have everybody working in whatever woodsy spot appeals to them. What do they do instead of that? They build the bloody Googleplex. Right? They build a building that crams everyone close in together because that's how innovation works. That's how cities work. Now, the important connection between new ideas, between knowledge and urban regeneration, explains the critical pattern of which cities enable to come back, why Boston looks so different from Detroit today, even though it didn't in 1975. Right? Skills. What you're looking at here is the share of the population with a college degree, and I split the uh, counties of the US into, into five bins on the basis of how educated their people were in the year 2000. The line shows population growth between 2000 and 2010. This has been true for the last 40 years. Right? Skills predict which cities come back and, and which cities didn't. Skills in the Sun Belt are particularly powerful. When you look at those cities that, that I'm most bullish about, in the warm areas of the country, there are places with very, very high rates of college degrees, like, for example, Atlanta, like Charlotte. I mean, Atlanta is, of course, essentially comparably educated to Boston, which is not a thing Bostonians like to admit very often. Um, but in fact, it is. And this combination of having relatively pro-business policies, sunshine and skills, is a particularly powerful combination. Now, it's not just about population growth, it's about earnings. This is the relationship between per capita productivity across metropolitan areas and the share of the population with a college degree in that area. There is something that economists call human capital externalities, which is that this relationship is far too strong to be predicted by the standard individual relationship between education and earnings. What it reflects is the fact that when you've got skilled neighbors, you become wealthier, you become more productive. The typical estimate is as the share of adults with a college degree in your metropolitan area increases by 10%, your wages go up by 8%, holding your own years of schooling constant. Right? This has grown over time. It explains why skilled people are increasingly clustered together in particular areas, and it explains why some cities have come back and not others. The impact of skills on, on earnings are even higher outside the US, and I'll skip over that. This is the relationship between PISA math scores and earnings across the world. Uh, and you'll notice the fit is pretty good. And it's an attempt to remind us that human capital, education, is the stuff not just of urban success, but of national success. And if we want our children to enjoy the same type of prosperity 50 years from now that we did, 
that we have, right? Investing in education is by far the most important thing that we can actually do in this country. Now, of course, skills, the skills that make cities work are not just or even particularly the skills that are communicated in the classroom. After all, as a, as a teacher, I'm often amazed when anything I have to say has any practical value whatsoever. Uh, it's the skills that are actually learned on the streets, it's the skills that Lou Ranieri picked up in the Solomon Brothers mailroom. And above all, the skills that matter most are the talent and inclination to be an entrepreneur. 50 years ago, the economist Ben Chinitz was comparing New York and Pittsburgh. And he was noting that even then, New York was more resilient. He argued that that difference reflected a culture of entrepreneurship that New York had because of its industrial history. I've already mentioned that New York had the largest industrial cluster in the US in the 1950s, and that that cluster was garments. The key to the garment trade is that it has very low returns to scale, that anyone with a good idea and a couple of sewing machines could get started in this industry. And the history of New York is replete with examples of people who got started sewing clothes and then did something else, something spectacular. I tell in my book the story of A.E. Lefkowitz, maybe forgotten here at this point in time, but at one point in time he was a real estate giant, built more skyscrapers than any other New Yorker did it during the 1920s. He got, started in real, he got started in the garment trade and then started rebuilding the garment district of New York and then moved fully into, into real estate development. Left court, of course, while well, uh, in the 1920s, he was enormously wealthy. He um, famously declared that 1930 would be the greatest of all building years. Um, he wasn't really right on that one and he ended his life in, in uh, relative poverty. Um, but there's statistical work that backs this up. It is remarkable, given how mediocre our measures of local entrepreneurship are how powerful they are in predicting urban success. What you're looking at here is one of the two prevalent measures for measuring entrepreneurship at the local level, which is having a lot of little establishments. So the, 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 the first line there shows those areas that have the smallest average establishment size. The five shows those areas that have the largest average establishment size. So compare, comparing places that have industries, like the garment sector, with places that have industries like steel. But this effect holds within industry as well and holds within city as well. It's an enormously robust fact. What you can see is that those cities that had the smallest average firm size had growth that was more than three times faster between 1977 and 2009, those areas that had the largest average firm size. An enormous difference between these, these areas. The same facts hold true if I look at, at the share of employment in startups in 1977 as my measure of entrepreneurship. Now, it turns out that one of the variables that really predicts this difference is the presence of mines in nearby areas. So if you want to know why Birmingham is a bigger firm place than other areas, it's because specifically of proximity to mines. This is a map of mines in the US in 1900. And it turns out that Chinitz's hypothesis seems to have been actually right, that if you were in a place like Pennsylvania with lots of mines, that created industries that look like this, and that creates kids who look like that, right? Who want to be company men just like their dads or their, or their moms. My, my mom was lifer at Mobile Oil, so I guess that makes me a company man a, as well. Uh, whereas the bottom industry, the bottom line, shows places that were without mines, that had industries like the garment sector that create this, this scrappy young lemonade sa sale, salesman over there. It turns out that mines do really predict industrial structure in the 1980s, mines at the start of the century, and they predict er resilience today. Now, the most entrepreneurial place on the planet I've ever been is the Dharavi slum of Mumbai a place that is crammed with talented Indians trying to figure out their way in the complicated world that surrounds them. Um, you walk down the streets of Dharavi, and there are a couple of guys sewing brassieres in one room, and you feel like you're in the Lower East Side of Manhattan in 1906. And, th and then you cross the street, and there are guys who are recycling boxes. Recycling boxes means just that they chop them up and turn them inside out and then restaple them so you can't see the old labels. Who knew there was a living in this? Uh, but apparently the city told them there was a living in this. You go a little bit further down, there's a ceramics cluster where they're making these beautiful little pots and they're so proud of them that they're not going to even take your money for giving them to you. And then a little bit further on, there are women who are sitting on the floor recycling plastics. And you just feel the tremendous promise of Indian talent, of Indian small businesses. And then you walk out in the street and you see a kid defecating on an unpaved road. And you know that the electricity frequently doesn't work, you know that the water isn't clean. And it reminds you that in fact, cities need more than just private talent. In fact, cities have demons that come with density, and cities have battled with those demons for 2,000 years. And in order to make cities livable, both in the US and outside, we need to defeat those demons that come from density. The most important of those demons is actually water, is actually the spread of contagious disease. Because if two people are close enough to give each other an idea face to face, they're also close enough to give each other a virus or some form of bacteria. And for thousands of years, we've been battling against the spread of contagious disease in, in cities. Um, the second would be traffic congestion, ubiquitous. 
uh, crime and corruption, and of course the high cost of living and property. All of these are the downsides of urban living, the things that seemed as if they had licked cities in the 1970s. Now, if you don't have to go that far back in Western history to see the kind of disease that you still see in cities like Mumbai. A boy born in New York in 1900 could expect to live seven years less than the US national average. Today, life expectancy in New York is actually three years longer than the national average. And no one exactly understands why death rates are lower for older New Yorkers. Some people credit walking, some people credit social connection. Among younger people, it's quite easy to see. Lower levels of motor vehicle accidents, it's just a lot safer to get on the subway after having a few drinks than to get behind the wheel of a car. And lower suicide rates, which remains something of a puzzle of, of urban areas. Um, but that didn't happen by accident. It required massive investments in especially clean water. America's cities and towns were spending as much on water at the start of the 20th century as the federal government was spending on everything except for the post office and the army. This didn't happen, the spending didn't happen easily. And it reminds us of the real challenges in getting cities to, to, to work. Um, these are, of course, two of our founding fathers. They're Aaron Burr and Alexander Hamilton. Uh, Burr would later shoot Hamilton on the shores of the Hudson. But before Burr shot Hamilton, he hired him to be his lawyer. Because um, Burr had an idea. Uh, his idea was he was, gonna ha he was gonna have a bank. And the way he was gonna get a bank was he was gonna wrap his bank up in a water company. Most of America's eastern seaboard countries had experienced yellow fever epidemics in the, in the 1790s, and people didn't understand the connection between yellow fever and water, the water vectors that lead to the mosquito proliferation that spreads the disease. But they still somehow they thought that they needed to provide better, cleaner water as a response to these epidemics. Philadelphia went the purely public route of providing uh, the public water works. Uh, Benjamin Latrobe was the engineer. Burr had a different idea. His idea was there was gonna be a subsidized private company that was going to provide water, and the subsidy was going to come in the form of a bank. So he hired Hamilton to convince Hamilton's buddies on the city council that having a public water system would lead to burdensome taxes. Those were Hamilton's exact words in language that would be quite recognizable today. They went along with Burr's plan, and of course Burr got his bank come water company. Now, the problem with the scheme should be obvious from the, from the get-go. You don't subsidize a not very lucrative activity like selling water with the ability to do some other activity that is incredibly lucrative, like banking, especially when there aren't a lot of other banks around. Right? And this is exactly what happened with Burr's company. Instead of being a water company, it became this, which, was of course, which is, of course, the Chase, J.P. Morgan Chase, which was the Chase Manhattan Bank, which was the bank of the Manhattan Water Company. It is false that, as Wikipedia claims, this thing is the cross-section of a water pipe. It's a purely abstract design uh, put together in the 1960s. But if it helps you to remember the watery antecedents, of J.P. Morgan Chase, by all means, use it as a mnemonic. Um, but it reminds us that actually there are some things that, that cities actually need government to do, that you actually can't rely on purely private providers to actually take care of. Now, it is true that in private developments, it can entirely be taken care of by a private developer who basically acts like a government. And you see some of that functioning in places like the Woodlands. But you do need some form of central authority to deal with the demons that come, uh, that deal, that come from density. Now, while uh, clean water fundamentally required an engineering solution, things like the Croton Aqueduct, congestion will not admit an engineering solution. We can't just build our way out of traffic congestion. There's something called the fun fundamental law of highway traffic, which is that vehicle miles travel, the number of guys on the road, increase roughly one for one with highway miles built. If you build it, they will drive. Which means that if you keep on trying to deal with traffic congestion by just laying down more lanes of highway, you're never going to solve the problem. You've got to do what Singapore does. You've got to actually charge people for using city streets. This, this is the electronic road pricing scheme. It differs by time of the day, and it actually charges people. In a sense, America's cities are following a Soviet-style traffic policy right now. I, I, you know, I miss the Cold War so much, so I'm glad to bring this up. Uh, the, um, the, and by that, I mean that in the old days, Right? The, the communists would have groceries, bread, butter, eggs, that were sold at far below market prices. The result of that, of course, was, as any econo economist could tell you, was long lines and stock outs. You couldn't actually get the goods that were nominally cheap. Well, that's what we're doing on our city streets. We're taking a resource that's incredibly valuable and we're giving it away for free. The result is the urban equivalent of long lines and stock outs, which is urban traffic jams. There's no way to handle this other than actually pricing those roads, actually charging people for the social costs of, the, of their action. Um, and, but if cities are able to deal with the downsides of density, they're able to deal with crime, they're able to deal with congestion, they can, of course, become places of remarkable pleasure as well as productivity. This is Orlando, of course. But um, the same urban proximity that leads towards innovation in financial services leads to innovation in restaurants. 
the same ability of cities to connect smart people to become entrepreneurs leads to connections in clubs and bars. There's a reason why cities are full of young single people. It's because they want to be near other young single people, and cities help make that happen. And of course, cities also enable the provision of those large fixed cost things like museums or large entertainment venues that can also be great elements of joy. And I think a world in which we are increasingly wealthy, increasingly educated, increasingly sophisticated, tends to push us back towards those, those urban pleasures. Now, the downside of cities succeeding as places of productivity as well as consumption is that they can risk becoming enormously expensive. And what you're looking at here is the decline in the number of housing permits in New York and the rise in prices. Just when Manhattan, just when New York got its act together in terms of handling its significant crime problems, in terms of the rebirth of financial services, right, they made it more and more difficult to build. There is no repealing of the fundamental laws of supply and demand. If you have strong and robust demand colliding against big supply, the result will be high prices and in an urban context, a boutique city that is affordable only to the wealthy. This is what Jane Jacobs, who was in so many ways a peerless urban analyst, got wrong. She looked around New York and she noted that old buildings were cheap and new buildings were expensive. And that led her to conclude in Death and Life of Great American Cities that the way to ensure housing affordability was to make sure that nobody built any new buildings on top of old buildings, to create historic districts like our own home area of Greenwich Village. That's not how supply and demand works, right? If you have robust demand for old buildings, their prices will also soar. And the only way that you make sure a city doesn't become unaffordable is you do what Chicago does and you unleash those cranes on Lake Michigan, right? That's how affordability works. You don't need to look further than her own Greenwich Village Historic Preservation District that she worked so hard to get, claiming that it would actually preserve affordability. And you, you'll see, of course, far from preserving affordability, that the kind of townhouse house that she lived in that was affordable to ordinary income Americans like herself and her husband in the 1950s, now that stuff starts at $5 million, and you've got to be a hedge fund manager to even consider it. Right? This is what shutting down development actually does in urban areas. That's what not allowing a supply response actually does. And you see this in the patterns of the US. This, this graph is meant to, meant, shows population growth between 2000 and 2010, which is also essentially housing unit growth and median housing values. And what you notice is the places that are expensive don't build a lot, and the places that build a lot aren't expensive. Okay? That is the prevalent pattern within the United States, and it's a pattern that makes eminent sense to anyone aware of basic economics. That if we, there's a reason why a million people moved to Houston between 2000 and 2010, and the overwhelming reason is it offers a decent quality of life with affordable housing prices. Um, and that comes fundamentally from supply. Now, it's Unfortunate when American cities restrict their building. It's tragic when this happens in Mumbai, which has labored under some of the most draconian floor area ratios of any city in the world over the last 40 years. On the benighted view that they wanted to restrict Mumbai's growth, they kept housing low. Um, the result was not a restriction of growth, but just vast overcrowding, a failure to deliver high buildings. And when high buildings were built, they were built surrounded by enough green space to cover the FARs that it made pedestrian traffic basically impossible. It was incredibly poor urban planning. This is what happens when we overly restrict our cities. Now, one of the reasons to actually get our urban policies right is that there's also an environmental advantage to building in cities. And this is a way in which environmentalists often get things, get things wrong. Um, I want to end, essentially, with a story about a young Harvard College graduate who a beautiful spring day in 1844 went for a walk in the woods outside of Concord, Massachusetts. And he went to do a little fishing, and the fishing was good because there hadn't been much rain lately. But when he came to cook the fish into a chowder, that's what we do in Massachusetts, we cook chowders. Uh, the wind flicked the flames to the nearby dry grass, and a fire started, and it spread. And by the time it was done, it was a raging inferno that had destroyed more than 300 acres of prime woodlands, a whole natural ecosystem destroyed by the carelessness of this young man. In his own day, he was castigated as an enemy of the environment. The conquered freemen called him a flibberty gibbet, which I think was pretty bad for 1844. Uh, and indeed, they were right to do so, because it's hard to think of any young man living in, in that year that did as much damage to the environment as this character did. Of course, today, oddly, he is revered as the secular saint of American environmentalism. He is Henry David Thoreau, whose book Walden appears to teach, uh, to teach the lesson of what a wonderful thing it is to live surrounded by abundant green space. But his own life teaches a very different lesson. His own life reminds us that we are a destructive species. And if we love nature, we should probably stay away from it, as we're more likely to do it harm than, than good. Now, um, there's actually a statistical companion with this, which is that people who live in denser areas typically involve significantly less energy usage. Um, this is typically from both lower, lower levels of driving 
and significantly smaller housing units. And I know from this personally, because when I started acquiring small children, only economists talk about acquiring small children, uh, I moved from this area out to this area, surrounded by about as much green space as, as Thoreau does, and um, doing about as much damage to the environment as, as he was in terms of expanded driving and, moving, and uh, increased housing size. Now, it's not that, you know, I'm an economist, I believe people should have choices. Right? And one of the things that I find most odd about the book is people think that I'm telling them that they should live in cities. I don't live in a city, right? I've got three small children. Uh, and one of the glories of America is that we've got options, right? Having different ways to live for different people is one of the great things about this country, and it should be true in every country. But people should pay for the social costs of what they, what they do, right? And that's a basic premise in, in economics. And if there are environmental costs from living in locations, then we should move against it. I think one of the things that's most tragic about people like me moving outside to cities is the extent to which we've done it because of government. We've done it because of public schools being such a problem in urban areas. And if I think about what is the most crucial element in terms of making, leveling the playing field, and that's all we should look for in terms of space. We shouldn't want pro-urban or pro-suburban policy. Is that we should actually try and make sure that, that any child anywhere can have access to a decent education, not, someone, not just someone who lives in a Tony suburb. Now, one of the reasons this really matters looking, looking forward is that if the great growing economies of India and China see their per capita emission levels rise to those seen in the United States and the sprawling US, global carbon emissions go up by about 130%. They stop at the level of hyper-dense but still wealthy Hong Kong global carbon emissions go up by about 30%. Now, I don't know for global warming. I'm not a, I'm not a climate scientist. But, and, but you don't need to believe in global warming to think that them building up rather than building out is a good thing because it also impacts your price of gas at the pump, right? You actually want them to do something. We as Americans want them to do something that involves building up rather than using the same incredibly energy intensive lifestyle that we, that we do here. And I think for that reason, it's important to rethink those urban policies that have too often pushed people away from subsidized uh, highways to weak urban schools and even to our policies regarding home ownership, which often push people away from urban apartments to suburban urban living. All of these things are ways in which we could actually come up with a more productive country uh, as a result. Now, I don't want to end on, I don't want to end on the environment, and I don't want to end on any sort of a dark note, because I think the point of this lecture is, the point of this lecture involves the word triumph, right? The point of this lecture is not a tragedy, is not that somehow the future of humanity or this country is bleak. The point of this lecture is that we have, as a species and as a country, over the past 200 years for a country and over the past 5,000 years for as a species, been capable of working miracles when we are connected by cities. When we learn from each other, when we innovate in ways that borrow each other's ideas, we have been doing things that have been spectacular. Whether or not they are Henry Ford in his car, or figuring out the cause of cholera when Jon Snow wanders around the streets of London and sees the pattern, the connection with the poison water pump that created the disease. Right? Cities have been helping us her learn, have been helping us create the font of knowledge which is the most important human asset. Because of that, and despite our current problems in the country, I remain enormously bullish on America and on, on the world. Thank you. Okay, we've got we've got time for questions. The uh, yes, sir. Well, I, I think it is a vote of confidence in American cities that they're, that they're doing this. I, I also think fear of outside ownership is almost always mistaken, right? That actually we should want people to buy, buy stuff. And, you know, think about all the Toyotas that were financed by that sale of Rockefeller Center, right? I mean, you know, this was, you know, we did fantastically well off of these sales. So the last thing we should do is be, be stopping people from paying high prices for our, for our assets. Um, but I think it's exactly right to emphasize the international character of our successful cities. So when you think about a city like Miami, um, despite current real estate hiccups, and I think a lot of that has to do with supply, that in fact Miami does, is, does make it fairly easy to build, and that's always going to keep uh, prices from, from going through the roof. But the basic urban structure of Miami is very, very robust, right? It's connected with, it is the gateway to Latin America. It is the gateway to a, a continent and a region that is only going to continue to grow, and cities continue to play that role whether or not you're on the West Coast and connecting to Asia, whether or not you're in New York and Boston connecting to Europe, this international role that cities play is really crucial, and foreign ownership is, I think, very much part of that. 
I do want to know, though, if it's true that, that uh, part of Trump's genius is cutting down on the elevator banks because there are so many uh, foreign owners that they actually don't need to ride the elevators up and, up and down the building since they're not, not there. Um, uh, more questions? The, uh, yes, sir. Yes. Do any of the cities that you've studied have a, a better urban school model, so, or are we destined for a generation gap in our cities for the next hundred years? It is the most troubling thing, right? And, and it's true that there's it's true that there's a uh, there's a young and old phenomenon in cities because of the school-age children phenomenon. It's also true that there's a rich and poor phenomenon in cities, in some sense, for the same reason, right? That cities are okay if you're enormously wealthy because you just avoid the public school system altogether. Um, and in some sense, the success of urban private schools reminds you that cities don't need to be bad for education. Right? The same competition that works wonders in the restaurant business should work wonders in the school business as well. But what we've done is it's sort of like if we took the restaurant business in New York and said it was all going to be provided by a single public canteen, right? you would lose all of that innovation and competition and all those great meals and you'd get you know, almost assuredly pretty crappy food. And yet we've, we've done that with schools, which are an even more important uh, resource. Um, I do think that there are, you know, I, I do think that there are signs of hope, um, although I think the big story is despite enormously talented people for working on this issue over the past 15 years, I mean, I, I just have enormous respect for Joel Klein, for example, in, in New York. Um, you know, they move the needle very, very little. Uh, the things that we know really about education in terms of, of things that really matter, first of all, charter schools really can work enormously well. And part of the beauty of charter schools is that when they're oversubscribed, admission is done by lottery, so you can compare lottery winners and lottery losers. And the best ones, which are typically the oversubscribed ones, it can actually work miracles. Um, so, you know, think for example the, the Harlem Children's Zone's Promise Academy, but there are also, in many cities, we've seen examples of them. In some sense, you're channeling that power of competition and innovation that cities have for, uh, for good. The second thing, of course, that's well known about cities, about schools, is the enormous power of teachers. It's really about the human capital in the, in the schools. My, my colleagues, John, Raj Chetty and John Friedman, have shown that the same teachers who raise test scores for kindergartners raise earnings for 27-year-olds. That in fact, there's a visible earnings effect for adults of having actually better teachers, which means that any innovations that work better to get the deadwood out of teaching, uh, out, of, out of schools and getting the best teachers that you can get, that's obviously worth a, worth a huge amount. Um, but I think the bottom line lesson is that progress has been painfully slow on, on schools. And, and uh, it remains, to me, the most pressing issue of, of cities uh, going forward. The idea of haves versus have-nots, um, does, uh, does that disparity widen further over time in cities that are succeeding, or does it somehow narrow, and is it meaningful? I think it, it depends a lot on both economic trends and, and public policy trends. I, I don't see anything, any obvious force that pushes against you know, inequality in, in the U.S. going forward. Right? I, mean, I, I don't see that unless, unless we're able to get our act together as an educated nation, and make sure that the bottom half of America has a better range of skills, or bottom quarter of America has a better range of skills. I just don't see how less skilled Americans are going to be thriving in the 21st century in a major way. And without, without that, I don't see the inequality disappearing. In terms of urban inequalities, it's somewhat different. Um, I mean, New York is expensive in part because the area is productive. Right? You, wouldn't, you wouldn't actually have firms being willing to put up with that unless they were, they were productive. But it's also expensive because the city has made it so difficult to build. Right? And that's, that's part of the sort of point about Jane Jacobs, that you know, we have other urban models where they've actually unleashed the, the cranes, as I said, which have actually been far more affordable uh, than New York. And I think Florida can be an example of that, that Miami is easier to build, and as a result, it's, it's, it's more affordable. So this, this sort of you know, rationing of city spots in, in high-end northeastern cities, that's a policy choice. Unfortunately, do I see much chance of that policy choice changing? No, I don't. I mean, I think the power of NIMBYism, the power of opposition to new growth is inexorable. And I think the American pattern is not so much that we conquer NIMBYism, but we just to move to some new green field where there aren't any neighbors to possibly complain, uh, complain at us. But, um, the, but it's, it's, if we actually wanted cities that did a better job of taking care of their poor people, those northeastern cities, we'd actually need to get new building. In some sense, it's, it's and I'll just end on this, it, it's, it's a cutting irony that you know, Massachusetts, which is as blue as they get, right, where you know, we care passionately about affordable housing, but the policies that we've embraced do an awful, awful job of actually promoting 
because every town has, has made it incredibly difficult to build housing. Boston itself is actually pretty good relative to surrounding suburban areas like the one that I live in. My town newspaper recently had a banner cover with um, celebrating the affordable housing breakthrough in the town. They built one unit. <laughs> they built one unit. The, the state rep was out there because they had built one unit. Okay. By contrast, red state Texas. Right? where I don't think a guy is being particularly committed to fighting inequality in some kind of major way, Red State Texas does an amazing job of actually pr producing a good quality of life for lower and middle income Americans because they aren't putting barriers to building. Because their policies, which are not necessarily motivated by some egalitarian no notion, actually are serving that purpose. And that's, there's a real lesson in that, in terms of the, the fact that there is no you know, small scale affordable housing policies by the cities of the, of the Northeast and California are never going to substitute for the private sector in terms of actually delivering ordinary housing to ordinary people that is actually affordable. That seems like a good note for me to end on. Okay, thank you very much for your time.